Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to be one of about three video casts about the structure and function of the plasma membrane, otherwise known as the cell membrane. I'm going to be using the words plasma membrane and cell membrane pretty much interchangeably. Now, key concepts to remember and that we're going to cover in these video casts is going to be the fact that the plasma membrane is made mostly of lipids and proteins. This structure is what allows the cell membrane to be selectively permeable, otherwise known as um, semi-permeable, and that transport through the membrane can be both active or passive. And there is something called bulk transport, which you, you probably already know as endocytosis or exocytosis. Okay, the first idea I want to cover today is this concept of the fluid mosaic model. And it's our most modern idea of um, how the cell membrane is built based on lots and lots of observations made over um, the last 120 so some years. And the first part of this is the idea of fluidity. Okay, so if we say that something is fluid, that means that it's not static. It's not just like a sheet of paper that's a sheet of paper and it doesn't really change. The, the cell membrane is a fluid structure, which means it's constantly moving and changing shape. And its elements are moving in relation to each other. So this is where the idea of fluidity comes from. The second part of this concept or this model is the idea of a mosaic. Okay, now a mosaic is, is a picture or an image formed from little, little pieces that fit together. And this is accomplished in the cell membrane by these embedded proteins, which come in lots of different shapes and have lots of different functions, but they all share the feature of being sunken into the bilayer of phospholipids or floating on top or attached to the bottom of it. So combining these two ideas, the idea of fluidity and the idea of a mosaic created by primarily protein molecules gives us the fluid mosaic model. Now here's a pretty complicated picture uh, or diagram based on what scientists think a cell membrane might look like if you could get close enough to it without destroying it. And this is the exact same picture that's in your textbook. And if you look closely here, you'll see there is a bilayer made up of these little molecules that all look very much the same with these larger purple colored molecules stuck into it. And you've got stuff interacting with the outer surface. This is the extracellular matrix, which we talked about earlier. And then you have the material on the inside of the cell in the cytoplasm, which is primarily going to be cytoskeletal elements like microfilaments and microtubules, which we've talked about earlier. And finally, stuck into the bilayer are these little cholesterol molecules, which we'll talk about also. Now, cholesterol molecules, you probably have heard of it in, as an ingredient in food that you need to keep to a minimum. It's a critical molecule. Uh, the problem is sometimes people eat too much high cholesterol food and their blood cholesterol levels get too high. But cholesterol is an absolutely necessary um, steroid. It's a type of lipid that gets built into the bilayer of the cell membrane. And the more cholesterol a cell builds into its bilayer, the more flexible that the cell membrane becomes. Now, as you probably know, when you chill lipids, think of an oil or a fat getting cool, it turns solid. So that's a problem with a cell membrane that's made up mostly of lipids. So the way evolution is compensated for this is um, cells that have to live at lower temperatures have higher concentrations of lipids, which, make, which keep the cell membrane more flexible at lower temperatures. Uh, cells that operate at higher temperatures have less cholesterol. So I think you get the idea. It's Again, it's structure producing a function. Now the basic part of all membranes, including the plasma membrane, are these molecules called phospholipids. And they are interesting because they have a hydrophilic region, uh, which we can represent here as a sphere, and then a hydrophobic region, which we can represent here as these two tail-like structures. Now the head, or the hydrophilic area, is polar which means that it will attract water, it will form hydrogen bonds with water molecules, and sitting right in the middle of it is a phosphate group. So sometimes this is called the phosphate head or the polar region. Down here, we have these fatty acid tails, and these are hydrophobic, and of course, uh, fats don't mix with water. So this is a saturated fatty acid tail, and this kinked one here represents an unsaturated fatty acid tail because we have one hydrogen bond right here that's doubled, excuse me, one um, carbon to carbon bond that's doubled, so we've lost some hydrogen, so it's been desaturated or unsaturated, which causes it to bend and take up a little bit more space, making it less dense and so on and so forth. So you get the idea. Phospholipids are bipolar in a way. They have a, a head end that's attracted to water and a 
two tails that repel water. So we can say that it's hydrophobic at this end and hydrophilic at this end. All right, now if you put phospholipids in water and shake them up, uh, they're going to form these droplets of a double, double layer of phospholipids encapsulating some water and, of course, with water on the outside. Because this is the only way physically that these little molecules can arrange themselves so that their fatty acid tails are away from the water molecules, if you think about it. So you kind of get this foamy, bubbly solution. And this is an elementary way to form a bilayer. Now, this is not necessarily alive. Um, there's nothing in here to reproduce or, or grow or develop, but this is a way that you can get a cell membrane-like structure just by putting phospholipids in water and agitating it. Now, the purpose of the, of the bilayer is to control what enters and exits the cells. And some things I want you guys to remember is that what can go into and out of a cell is going to be dependent on two factors, okay? It's going to be size and charge, okay? How big is the ion or atom or molecule, and does it carry a charge? Is it positive or negative? So if the molecule is large or if it has a charge, it probably can't get through the phospholipid bilayer unless it goes through a specially built gate, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So the bigger it is and the more charge it has, the less likely it is to be able to leave the cell if it's already inside or get into the cell if it's on the outside. Now, probably the most confusing aspect of all this is going to be osmosis. And you guys have been hearing about osmosis probably since middle school. So let's try to narrow down some facts about osmosis and look at it from a, a chemistry point of view. And then we'll apply that chemistry to biology. Okay, you should remember that water molecules are very small molecules. They're only two hydrogens and one oxygen big. And they may be able to get through the phospholipid bilayer all by themselves. But this isn't going to happen in large numbers, and it's not going to happen very quickly because, remember, water molecules are polar. They have a charge to them. So water molecules are primarily entering and exit cells by passing through special portals or channels called aquaporins. We'll look at one in just a minute. And aquaporins are there just to allow water to flow into the cell or out of the cell according to um, its concentration gradient. Now, water molecules, of course, dissolve solutes. So this means water molecules are attracted to solute ions or molecules. We'll look at a picture of that. And this attraction causes or produces the effect of solutes pulling water molecules towards them. And this effect is one way of thinking of osmosis. And water will always move down its concentration gradient. So what that means is water will always flow from where there's a lot of water to where there's not much water. And solutes dissolved in water have the effect of reducing the concentration of water. And I'm hoping I'll make that pretty clear to you. Now, what happens when you put a solute in water is it dissolves, and it dissolves because the water hydrates it. And what this means is that if, say, for example, you put some salt, which is NaCl, sodium chloride, in some water. So we're going to make a salty water solution. What actually happens is the sodium ions, which are positively charged, okay, so you're going to get Na pluses, like right here, they're going to attract the negative or the oxygen ends of the water molecules. And the chlorine ions, which are Cl minus, like this guy, much larger, they're going to attract the positive hydrogen ends of the water molecules. So what you get are hydration cell shells surrounding each of these ions and keeping them apart, keeping them away from each other. So if you take some salt water and you boil it and you push all the water molecules away, then finally these two ions get close enough together where they can crystallize again and turn back into a um, sodium chloride crystal. So I think you guys get the idea of why things dissolve in water. Now here's a, a computer-generated picture of what scientists believe aquaporins look, in, look like. They are a collection of embedded proteins stuck into the phospholipid bilayer. The end that's sticking out, the ends that stick out, are hydrophilic. They're attracted to water. And the whole thing is anchored in the phospholipid bilayer by these... Um, these nonpolar regions down here, which are hydrophobic. So the net effect is you form a channel through which water molecules can enter and exit. Now, I'm not sure if 
an exiting aquaporin is flipped, like with this end towards the other end, I don't know. But just remember, aquaporins are gateways for water molecules to flow into or out of a cell. And the more aquaporins a cell has in it, the faster water molecules are going to osmose in or osmose out. All right, now the net direction or the flow of water due to osmosis is going to be determined primarily by the solute concentration. And we have different words to describe these different environments. Now we can take out the word solution and just put environment here. It means the same thing. So if you have a cell, this is the cell, and it's in an environment that is hypotonic, that means the concentration of solutes in the cytoplasm of the cell is high compared to the concentration of solutes outside the cell in the environment. So we can say the environment has a lower concentration, hence the use of the prefix hypo. So in this situation, there is more solute in here and less solute out here, so that means that there's more water outside than inside comparatively. So we're going to get a net flow of water into the cell. So a hypotonic environment is a swelling environment. It's going to cause animal cells to swell or get larger and eventually rupture. An isotonic environment, iso means equal, the concentration of solutes is the same on both sides of the membrane, so the net flow of water is in dynamic equilibrium, which means for every molecule of water that leaves, it's balanced by another molecule of water that enters. So this is a homeostatic environment, which means it's balanced. It's not really swelling the cell or shrinking the cell. And finally, a hypertonic environment. Hyper, of course, is a prefix that means higher. This environment means that the concentration of solutes outside the cell membrane is higher than what's inside. So the net effect of this is, is to pull the water out as it tries to hydrate all these um, solute molecules out here. And this is a shrinking environment or a shriveling environment. So cells are going to shrink. All right. So these are two very, three very good words to be able to use because you can use them to talk about why water is flowing in the direction that it's flowing. Okay, just a quick review here. So if we set up a really simple experiment where you have a semi-permeable membrane dividing a beaker of water containing a solute on one side but no solute on the other, and if this membrane is intact and it won't let the solute molecules diffuse to reach equilibrium, then osmosis will kick in and we'll get a change in water level on the side, an increase on the side where there are more solute molecules. Okay, now all this contributes to something we call water balance. All cells have to deal with this and it, it's a part of their homeostasis. Now animal cells, we've already talked about this, a paramecium, for example, lives in a freshwater environment, so that means its cytoplasm is hypertonic compared to the environment, or it's living in a hypotonic environment. It has evolved structures called contractile vacuoles. We watched a video of these, which constantly pump extra water back out of the cytoplasm into the environment. This is part of the cell's osmoregulation. Uh, you probably see the, the word osmosis hiding in osmoregulation. This is the way that a single-celled organism or a multi-celled organism controls its water balance. Osmo, referring to water, and regulation, keeping it balanced. Now, plant cells in fresh water, like most plants growing in soil, which is wet, grow root hairs, and they are in a hypotonic environment. They're always in a situation where water is going to be trying to move into their cells, as long if they keep the solute concentration in their cells higher than the environment. And this produces something called turgor pressure, which is unique to plants because they have the cell wall. Plant cells can swell up, but they don't pop, they don't rupture. And let me show you what, what I mean here. Um, this is a really um, good microscope cross-section of a plant root. Okay, this is root cells. Here, okay, this structure right here is a root hair. And root hairs are microscopic. They are very small and they're made up of an extension of one um, cell on the epidermis of the root. And what happens is out here we have the soil, and in the soil there is water, and inside of the cells there is a lot of solute dissolved, especially sugars. Uh, remember, photosynthesis makes sugars. So we have a hypotonic environment. The water in the soil is hypotonic compared to the cytoplasm of the root hairs. So all the cell has to do here is 
have aquaporins and a porous cell wall so that water molecules can constantly osmose or move into the root hair and then get transported up the root. And this is how plants absorb water from the soil. They use osmosis to do this. This is incredibly important. And most important, it is free. The cell does not have to use any ATP to do this. It just has to keep the um, solute concentration in its cells higher than the solute concentration in the soil. Okay, we'll stop there and pick up with the next video cast. Thanks for listening.